five, four, three, two, one, zero. <laughs> Listeners and my <laughs> new listeners, um, um, welcome to Grasping Sasquatch Stories and Science. Today we're going to tackle the scientific validity of photographs, be they still photos, video photos, FLIR, whatever the case may be. We're going to quickly say hello to those attending so far, which includes Craig. Hey, buddy, how you doing? Charlotte J., thank you for being first again. Um, Uncle Bones, thank you, as always, for being here. And nice to see ASPA60 here again as well. Thank you. Um, my good former research assistant and um, good friend, Carolina Puerto, who... Um, just returned to her home in Merida after being in a film produced by his son, who is actually going to be distributed. What it that is actually going to be distributed into some film festivals. I don't seriously know if it's can, but um, she's got a few lines in there. So congratulations to her, Jenky1044. Nice to see you, buddy. I appreciate that, Eric. Sal, so, nice to see you again. Thank you. A um, couple quick announcements. I'm looking forward to some changes. We learned from our mistakes and the technical screw-ups I've been having, especially the last one, made me have to rebroadcast that show, record it, and drop it again. And when I did so, I just committed to myself that I would not rush through it. I always feel rushed through these 55 minute um, segments that we've got to do to get out of here in time. Hey, Dan Kegley, folks. Nice to see you, Dan. Dan is in my book, featured as um, Braveheart, because he held his ground when we were either facing a landslide um, or a uh, bluff charge or a charge, I guess bluff charge, from a Bigfoot or two. So awesome to see him. Um, so the lesson I learned is that when I don't feel as pressured to rush through all this time, um, things go a little bit better. It, it's an easier pace. I can speak to more things on the slides. And so as a result, I'm looking to move and bump my time slot up earlier. Probably looking in a week or two, not next week, but maybe the week after that. I want to have the word out a couple weeks. That'll be, rather than starting at 7, I'm going to be starting at 6 o'clock and will still be available until 8 o'clock. But I'm anticipating an hour and a half to an hour and 50 show, depending on what else unfolds. We've got some other things in the work. As a matter of fact, um, with somebody in the audience right now, and um, 
we're going to see about um, doing, well, I'll just leave it at that. We'll see what we see and what evolves from that. But more time so I don't have to rush through grasping Sasquatch and more exciting things to come as far as that goes. So the title of the show is Grasping Sasquatch Stories in Science. And so we're, since we're going to be talking about photography, I thought I'd read from once again my personal Sasquatch Bible, Sasquatch Legend Meets Science 2, Jeff Meldrum. I think it's the first authoritative book on the science behind Bigfoot, which is what I'm about. And so, let's see if you, how long it takes you folks to put this together. As they returned from the trip, they found a message waiting for them from Al Hodg Hodgson in Willow Creek, California. Hodgson had learned from John Green about fresh tracks found along the Blue Creek Mountain Road discovered after the Labor Day weekend. He waited until Green and Rene DeHendon had examined the tracks and left the scene and then gave Patterson a call to let him know new tracks had recently been discovered. Patterson was hopeful of getting footage of fresh tracks to include in a documentary film he had been putting together um, over the previous eight months featuring interviews of eyewitnesses and shots of the location where they had the reported seeing of a Sasquatch. They took their two saddled horses and a pack horse, Gimlin's one-ton truck and horse van, and supplies to keep them for two weeks or more. In fact, it was Gimlin's equipment that made the trip possible. Patterson was out of work at the time and was receiving some financial backing from his brother-in-law, Al Diatli. Or, yeah, Diatli. By the time they arrived, Rains had effectively eradicated um, whatever tracks remained on Blue Creek Mountain. Um, it's quite a haul back in there. I've never been, but that's what I hear. Um... Although traces remained, Bob admitted he could not make much out of them. They set up a base camp down across Bluff Creek and began patrolling the dirt roads. The route was the routine was to wait until they had until the heavy construction and logging rigs were off the roads and then ride them on horseback looking for tracks or whatever might turn up returning to camp at night. By night, they would slowly drive the roads in the truck looking for that, that what might have been left across them. They rode out singly in order to cover more ground, searching for sign along the creek beds and up the mountainsides throughout the region. This went on for a couple of weeks. Gimlin recalled the morning of October 20th, 1967. The day we got the film footage, I left early that morning and Roger slept in. I just rode out and around. I always got up early and I rode on out. My horse loosened a shoe and I came back in, into, to, into camp to tack it tighter. About 10 mid-morning or so, or so I sat around there for a little while because Roger had gone when I got back. Supposedly, he had gone down to the creek there, uh, Bluff Creek there, and after a while, he came back and asked what area I'd covered in the morning. I told him, and he says, why don't we ride up into this area we've ridden into before, a desolate type area down a couple canyons. There's a creek running through it, so we went ahead and fixed lunch. He said, let's get our gear together, so we ride out and stayed right out. We can stay if we have to and stay a little bit later into the night if we need to. 
We packed up the pack horse and it was about midday. They were riding upstream on the right hand side of Bluff Creek. Roger was in the lead, followed by a horse length, and two behind by Bob Gimlin with the pack horse in tow. Several miles upstream, stream, they skirted a large downfall tree and a large root wad that had diverted the flow of the creek. They rounded the obstruction. There was a log jam, a um, crow's nest left over from the flood of 64 that had scour scoured the narrow, val narrow valley and piled up the logs. Suddenly, there was the entire creature standing by the edge of the creek, a mere 60 to 80 feet to their left. In Bob Gimlin's words, when I first saw it, it was standing looking right at us. That's when everything started happening. The horse started jumping around, raising the devil and spooking from this creature. Roger, well, his horse was rearing up and jumping around. Patterson's horse, younger and less experienced, tried to spin around and come back. Gimlin's was more seasoned, a more seasoned roping horse, but it's still spooked by the encounter with the figure. Patterson was trying to control his horse with one hand while reaching back into the saddle for his camera with the other. He was quite agile and athletic since he did rodeo riding and gymnastics. Didn't know that. He, he, he was a maneuverer and he had practice. He always kept that. This, this was a maneuver he had always practiced. He always kept that saddlebag ready. Saddlebag had two straps on it to keep buckled down. He kept one buckled and the other unbuckled so he could get his camera in the event he needed to hurry. And this was the case in this particular time. That was the theory that if he got to get it, he would kept one buckle on there so it would not bounce out while he was riding and the other one loose so he could get it in a hurry said Gimlin. Patterson slid off the horse with his camera in hand and the horse ran off, prompting the pack horse to jerk free from Gimlin and follow. Patterson called out, cover me, as he ran across the creek towards the sandbar, which had a slight elevation of about 30 inches. Um, the camera to his eye. With his vision restricted by the viewfinder, he ran into the sandbar and fell to his knees. Gimlin could see within his field of vision while keeping his eye on the creature, which had immediately turned and begun retreating up the sandbar and parallel to the creek bed. Gimlin rode across the creek, dismounting, and pulled his .30-06 rifle from its scabbard. He figured it became necessary. He figured if it became necessary, he could get off a surer shot on foot than in the middle of a in the saddle of a jittery horse. He recalled that at the same time he was young, was still hunting, and was an excellent shot. They always carried rifles when they rode in the mountains, but not with the intent to shoot Sasquatch. We had talked about it, but it decided unless it was necessary, we would never shoot. In other words, unless it was violent and attempted to attack us, I just stood there with my rifle. I never raised the rifle like I would shoot at anything. Um, it was like I just held it in my hand with the other hand held to my horse to keep him getting away from me. The creature twice the creature reacted twice to their approach, glancing back once when Gimlin crossed the creek on horseback. At that moment, Gimlin was the, at the closest to the creature, or perhaps less than 60 feet. The second glance, which has become the most publicized frame of the film, frame 352, occurred either when Patterson repositioned himself to a better vantage point or when Gimlin dismounted behind him. 
It was all happening so fast, he was uncertain precisely where the creature's attention was focused. Fatigued from weeks of hard riding and searching the countryside day and night, the gravity of the moment did not immediately weigh upon Gimlin. Then the reality of what they were witnessing suddenly struck him. When I saw this thing, it was almost unexplainable how I felt. I thought, is this really true? Is this really happening? Here I am. I've been here. I'm tired. But this thing is real. It's real. It's human-like. It's walking upright, and it doesn't seem to be walking fast, but it's covering ground quickly. Its walk was extremely graceful, especially for a huge creature like that. I didn't notice that it brought up its knees fairly high, but I took into consideration that it was a pretty heavy animal or pretty heavy creature. I'm not going to call it an animal because I don't believe it is. Gimlin described his initial impressions of the creature's size and weight. I thought it was about six and a half feet tall, and I would have guessed weighed at 250 to 300 pounds. It did have tremendous muscle bulk. It was massive. This was an estimated guess as to as the time at the time of the course. I'm not used to seeing things like that. I was just guessing weight compared to the amount of muscle quarter horses have. It was as big as a quarter horse, naturally, and the height we were up on our horses at the time we first saw the creature. It probably didn't look as tall as it really was. Now the horse I was riding was six, a 16-hand horse. One hand is four inches on a horse. My horse was 16 hands plus my saddle. That would make him approximately 16 and a half hands high. Now, of course, with me sitting up there, you can figure my eye level was about nine feet high. And anything actually less than nine feet high you would be looking down. And I'm just going to stop there with my lousy Bob Gimlin impressions. But the reason I, I brought this story and read this story from you, from Jeff Meldrum's book, just to make it all effect, official, um, that was um, page 138 to... Uh, 141 in Sasquatch Legend Meat Science 2 is because as most of you or many of you know that resulted in what's called the Patterson Gimlin film. Now the Patterson Gimlin film in the Bigfoot community today is considered the gold standard but I thought since we were talking about video photography, um, FLIR, other types of imaging, it would be important to, to think about that and those details. Um, you know, it's considered the gold standard now in terms of any hopes of scientific evidence, which you guys know that's what I'm here to, to preach on. We think about what we got. We got a visual sighting by two men. We got film by one of those gentlemen. We've got subsequent film of the footprints that they made after they had this experience. We've got casts of those footprints. And those casts have been examined by Dr. Jeff Meldrum and authenticated as Bigfoot casts. So we've got all those data points. How many data points is that? That's two people. That's one data point. That's the film, second data point, film of footprints, third, um, cast of footprints, and validation. We've got five data points that evolved 
or have come into being as a result of that one incident and document it in that film. So, I think that stands as a real important bar to set or hallmark to be aware of because we've got five data points there and it's still not considered sufficient to scientifically prove Bigfoot as a species. Well, how is any of the pictures, the single shot pictures we see on Facebook or any of the other platforms, the social media platforms, if that video with all that, all that concurrent and converging data wasn't enough, why would we even fantasize that a single off photo would be scientific enough. So, what is the problem here? One, we've got the stack deck stacked against us. Um, I'm going to quickly go over these definitions so we have a common ground upon which to work. Validity. The validity in a test or the validity in a study refers to are we measuring what we're saying saying we're measuring our ultimate experiments are targeting bigfoot so when we say we're measuring bigfoot or bigfoot phenom phenomena are we in fact measuring bigfoot reliability are we measuring the same thing we we're trying to measure each time we measure it can our test or our experimental design accurately replicate and capture Bigfoot the same way, the same time, each time? Coincidence, correlation versus causality. We've been over this before. Coincidence is just a random act that just happens to correspond with it. Maybe a change in your routine or something you do, did. Baseball players who hit a home run, they keep wearing the same jock strap or underwear because it, they think that that jock strap made them hit a home run. But it's just a coincidence. Two random events happen at the same time, but we make a relationship between them when there is no true relationship. Correlation, the way to understand correlation is the two variables, the two things that you're looking at, for example, tree knocks and Bigfoot, they co-relate to each other. They share a relationship together. And then causality, one thing causes the other. One of the benefits of the research that has been done over the past 60 years is we know that Bigfoot doesn't cause tree knocks to happen. And we can say that because to prove causality, there has to be a 100% correlation, a 100% co-relationship between the phenomena you're measuring and Bigfoot. So for us to technically say Bigfoot's cause tree knocks, Every time you hear a tree knock, or every every time you hear a tree knock, or you respond to a tree knock, a Bigfoot should respond back. There's a causal relationship. A tree knock makes a Bigfoot do a tree knock. If anything, it's probably the other way around when you get back down to it. A big a potential Bigfoot doing a tree knock causes us to typically respond more frequently with a tree knock. So we already know there's not a causal relationship between tree knocks and Bigfoot, but there is a correlation, co-relationship. Sometimes when you make a tree knock, a Bigfoot does make a tree knock. I'm back. 
photos. We're going to define photos for our discussion tonight as any photo, black and white color. Um, it could be on the old fashioned film. It could be digitized. It could be FLIR. It could be thermal. It could be night vision. We're covering all photos. So why are, uh, why are so many photos scientifically worthless? And what can you do to increase the value, the scientific value of those photos? Let's just look at photos for one thing. The old-fashioned photos. It's an analog measure of reality. It's not reality in and of itself. And this is something we almost take for granted in the Bigfoot field. Because we talk about and defend, people talk about and defend their photos as if those photos represent reality. At best, those photos are a copy of reality with flaws in it. Be you use one of your automatic high-tech cameras that does everything for you, focuses, adjusts the shutter speed, everything like that, or be you use an old-fashioned one where you adjust the, the shutter speed and the f-stop to determine how much light should come in. We are, those variables are controlled, and in controlling those, we are distorting from consensus reality, from the actual consensus reality. And this is why science will never consider those videos reality, those pictures reality. This is why one-offs of them don't have any scientific value as far as proving Bigfoot's existence. Now, if you want to take keep them as trophies for yourself, have at it. If you want to keep those as trophies for the community, have at it. Um, you know, there are a lot of genuine Bigfoot pictures out there, I believe. I'm not saying that there aren't. But basically, like stories, um, they boil it down to stories are a verbal anecdote. We need to start thinking about pictures as a visual anecdote. Anecdotes are the weakest form of scientific evidence. And in the Patterson-Gimlin film, we got the anecdotes, verbal anecdotes of two men. We've got film of the creature, film of its feet, casts of its feet, verified with the world's greatest expert on validity of casts and footprints. So if you think, and I, I'm not trying to offend, but if you think a single whole video of Bigfoot, or you think a photo or multiple photos of Bigfoot are going to offer that proof to science, it just isn't happening. If it was going to happen, it would have happened already with the Patterson-Gimlin film. Okay? Um, the value? It's as close as we're going to get right now to consensus reality. But it's not consensus reality. And it's, it's separate from, and if you really look close, it's not going to be the same, the same colors, the same hues, the same size of the creature from the perspective that you're standing. None of that is going to be the same as your experience in reality. And unfortunately, we already know that your experience in reality is reduced down to a verbal anecdote. Okay. Any questions about that? 
That's a pretty important but basic thing to understand. Okay? Typically, we only use one camera. That's one data point. Even if you're using one video camera, filming a Bigfoot in movement, as was the case of um, the Patterson-Gimlin film, uh, that's still, the film itself is still just considered one data point by science. Oops, sorry. Eric, you have some serious questions. Bring them on, buddy, as I'm talking. Um, um, so you're only using one camera. You're only getting one data point. You want to increase your sci the scientific value of your photos? Use at least three cameras. Three of the same is fine, but three different would be any be even better. Here we go. We got a question. What if several people capture the same thing from many different cameras or phones? There you go. And that's, thank you, um, Troy. That's an awesome question and, and actually right on time. Because I'm just talking now about how you want to use multiple cameras, at least three. Why three? Science is all about foundations and firm foundations. And a two-legged stool does not represent a third foundation. Anytime you do any kind, kind of constructions, you can't support the foundation or you can't support the object with just two points of support. You need three points to support a stool so you can sit on it. Well, it's the same thing with science. They like the number three because three for, 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 you can form a foundation. So, and if several people capture the same thing for many different cameras, isn't that all the better? Yeah, because now not only do you have the the visual sighting of that many people however many there are but you then have independent video or photographs of as many people as are there but you know what and i hate to try try i'm not trying to crash or trash your question, because it's an awesome one, and I'm not trying to trash photography, believe it or not, although I'm probably doing a pretty good job. Um, it still boils down to photos. Photos themselves are not scientific. Now they're gonna be it's gonna be of more scientific value when you've got multiple, and that's one one way to improve the potential value, but you're still just taking a photo of one experience. From different perspectives, great, more value, but it still boils down to a photo. The Patterson-Gimlin film, the um, Freeman footage, have already proved to us that photo and video evidence aren't being going to be good enough to scientifically prove Sasquatch as a species. Honestly, and at the risk of sounding like a, at the risk of sounding like a, uh, you're jumping ahead of me, ASPA 60 at the rate of, at the rate of sounding like a conspiracy theory, um, theorists, excuse me, you know, it really does seem we've got the DAC stack, deck stacked against us because there have been other species that have been proven no longer extinct based on a photograph and a visual sighting. 
but uh, we've got we've got the deck 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 stacked stacked against us, and it still boils down to photos, and photos are not reality. We can increase the scientific value of those photos. And in the, in the next slides, I'm going to begin to discuss how you can genuinely make them scientific, of scientific value. Um, single exposure. We make a single, single exposure even if we snap off a bunch of exposures. We're still dealing with pictures. Multiple exposures, as, as was suggested by the question from different people, yes, that's going to be more valuable going to be more valuable but its value is still limited by the fact that they're photos and you're presenting those photos of evidence in and of itself out of the context of any experimental design an a priori hypothesis a priori means um ahead of time you're t offering those photos up and in and of themselves as evidence now if those photos occurred within the context of an experiment that then got scientifically reviewed as aspa 60 was saying peer review and had gone through data analysis retesting and retesting and then those photos become scientific troy i don't know looks like you got another question bud thank you you know i'm not sure how um mountain gorillas were proven to exist i think they were probably being poached a long time um, then, uh, long time before they were discovered by Western society. Um, so I don't know. That's a good question. I would put that question to the, uh, the chat. If anyone knows how mountain gorillas were proven to exist as a unique species. I know Jane Goodall and or Diane Fossey had something to do with it. Beyond that, I don't know the answer to that question. Sorry, bud. Um, the other thing is about photos and photo equipment. We've gotten hooked on the digital age, the electronic age. These digital cameras, they make too many decisions for you. In doing so, they often produce more artifacts in and introduce them into the film or the camera. The did you? I'm sorry, it's not neither. Into the digital matrix that is going to be impacted by that automatic focus, by that automatic shutter speed. If you focus to the left of the creature. What's going to come into focus is what's to the left and behind of the creature rather than the creature. If you're focused on the creature and it moves slightly the instant you take the picture, you're going to get a blurry creature. It doesn't matter how fast that shutter speed is. Okay. Um, photos are highly malleable, especially the digital photos. And you see, we're seeing, rightly so, we're seeing chats about this all over um, different boards. Um, electronic data, digitized data, is easily to manip easy to manipulate during the taking of the picture, but more importantly, can be radically altered post-exposure. Well, I'll just do a little stabilization here. Um, we'll um, depixelize this section of the shot over here and, and fill it in over here so that that becomes clearer. Um, we'll zoom in on this part of her 
of her leg or her face or her eyes. We take all these after production manipulations as genuine or legitimate without ever understanding what is going into those changes. What is the program and what is the program language that's written to, to make things depixelate? or repixelate somewhere else. How does the computer in that camera make that decision? How does it make the decision about zooming and what to do with what pixels as it zooms in? We're taking all this stuff for granted, but as we make these manipulations, it's taking us even further and further from the consensus reality of the original photograph, thereby making it less valid of a measure than the original photograph itself, because we're changing it. Does that make sense? And of course, then we've got the problems with infrared. Trail cams, the general consensus in the community seems to be um, they can detect infrared. You'll hear people swear to it. Has anyone ever done or has anyone in chat or anywhere else in the world heard of a systematic study to determine whether Bigfoot is sensing the infrared? Has anyone? Does anyone know of any? Why hasn't something basic like that, basic experiment, been done? We, we leap from, well, deer can see them, so they're mammals, and it, Bigfoot must see them. But Bigfoot apparently has other qualities that deer don't, and deer have other qualities that Bigfoot don't. So our data in our community right now is based primarily on assumptions, logic, reasoning, ideas, but not hypotheses. No one's tested. Again, please, God, I hope somebody has actually done a scientific experiment on whether Bigfoot or what other species can 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 conduct or detect infrared in those tra camera traps. I know it hasn't been done. I, well, I, I'm, I'm, I shouldn't say I know. It seems highly unlikely it's been done for Bigfoot. Yet, there's a whole industry being developed around that as we speak. So what's the solution? Believe it or not, what goes around comes around. Go low tech. It allows you to make the decisions on where to focus, the shutter speed, how much light to let in. It's simpler when it comes down to it. I understand that the electronics in these cam cameras make it simple, but they also make it simpler for the shot to get screwed up by what they do that you're not controlling when you take that picture. Um, film... Guess what? It's less malleable. It's harder to manipulate or alter in its original form. You know, most of what's being studied and examined on the Patterson-Gimlin film are copies of the Patterson-Gimlin film. And you may or may not know that each time you make a copy of a film, the quality of the film degrades. Oh, well, we'll just digitize it and fix it up. Oh, God, now we're in a big mess. Because now we're manipulating the images to suit our image of what a Bigfoot is. Okay? So, going back to film makes the, the actual initial image harder to fake, harder to manipulate. And the older cameras, 
like they used for the Patterson Gimlin film. Um, they're still available, believe it or not, and you can still get um, you can still get um, the film for them. Another reason why a lot of photos are are scientifically worthless is they're used as an independent they're used independent of experimental design. And this is the big point, folks. Um now wait, what's this going on? Guess no one can really really care to see the answer. Is that anything that I can help with, folks? The last one was about mountain gorillas. Maybe no but he knows about that. I don't know. Um, sorry, cryptic. Um, the overall solution to, I guess, to jump ahead a little bit is you've got to, rather than rather than continuing to use your photographs as the proof itself from the image you got to start using your photographic images to gather data within the context of an experimental design that asks a specific hypothetical question before you start snapping pictures it comes back to the experimental design. If your photographs are part of a scientific study and they're, they're being used for, um, uh, they're being used for validity. One type of validity is called concurrent validity. And so the, um, the question that was asked about multiple people taking um, pictures of the same animal at the same time with different camp cameras. Each one of those different cameras represents concur concurrent validity and strengthens the scientific value of those pictures because they're convert uh, they're concurrently they're taken at the same time and they're showing the same data. In this case, a picture of Bigfoot. But, and this was the downside to the answer, they're not occurring within the context of an experimental design. I guess you could argue that our hypothesis is Bigfoot exists and our experimental design is going to go out to go out and hunt for Bigfoot and take a picture of it. Okay. I... That's not going to get you through science. Um, so you've got to use it within a part of a larger ex pre planned experimental design that um, asks a question either about Bigfoot or Bigfoot phenomena. I want to thank Craig, Craig um, Roach for this next portion of the show because. He really put this in the forefront of his mind with his um, show on equipment. When he was talking about all the things we don't understand about our equipment because maybe we haven't checked it out. The more we understand, systematic investigation, yes, Sasquatch wi wizard. Um, the more we can be systematic and first experimenting with your equipment so you know what's going on and not just qualitatively quantitatively you know you're measuring how far from the ground you position this camera compared to how far from the ground you position another camera further down the trail and then you're going to keep track of which camera gets you the best shot of Sasquatch? Or which camera gets you the best shot of any animals, for that matter? And so you learn that a camera at 
a certain height above the ground, four feet above the ground, consistently gets more hits of animals and maybe Sasquatches than the camera positioned two inches above the ground. But you go further than that and you can still analyze that data. If you've got six Bigfoot hits with the camera at four feet and you've got four Bigfoot hits with the camera at two inches off the ground, which is the most effective camera? You will not know unless you calculate what something is called a statistic a t-test which involves calculating the averages and the standard deviations for those two different cameras and then testing if there's a significant a statistically significant difference between those two cameras performances so you need to test your for position you need to test all the settings on your equipment to see if one makes a significantly better outcome than the other. Light profusion. Somewhere on the web today, I saw somebody presenting on the amount of light and what that does to our digital images. You've got to understand all that stuff, and that's got to be your baseline before you move on to then using them in other types of experiments. Concurrent validity. We've already talked about that with everybody catching the same picture. But again, no a priori hypothesis or experimental design per se. But, you know, let's say you're, you're going to test gifting. And you want to determine whether Bigfoot responds better to food gifts versus handmade manufactured gifts, um, something non-food like. So you set two cameras on the gifting site right beside each other. You sit, you, you um, sit, let's just throw in a FLIR, right, looking at the gifting site. Then you go deeper into the woods and you set a camera and a FLIR on one side of the site, two on the other side of the site, and maybe one behind it. Hide them. So they're not easy to see. Don't use um, IR, infrared activated settings. And you're hanging out all night when you're at a Bigfoot expedition anyways. Hang out and catch the video yourself or some of it yourself. If all those cameras pick up that Bigfoot coming to get that food as the gift that's concurrent validity you got another station set up the same way same general location but with something like a blanket or a baby doll or something shiny replicate it just like you did it with the food do, do the same monitoring with the, on the material site. And then can compare the frequency of where Bigfoot shows up much. Run it through a statistical analysis. That's concurrent validity in an experiment. Convergent validity is a finding that tells you it's not Bigfoot. You see... Um, squirrels coming to both sites and dragging off your material and dragging off your food. Or maybe you see at the Bigfoot, um, at the material site, you document Bigfoot coming to get that 
But at the food site, you document a squirrel seeing that. That's called that's called divergent validity. Excuse me. You've got two separate pieces of data that one tells you something that it is. It's a Bigfoot. And the other piece of data tells you it's not a Bigfoot. Convergent validity is when all things point towards Bigfoot. And we're going to have to finish up. I got out of here. We'll get out of here. We'll spend just a few minutes on this in our next show. And we'll see you guys later. Thank you very much. Keep your um, minds open. Your uh, boots on the ground and your heart with your higher power. Good evening. I see you running from